When I turned 14 years old, my family packed up everything that fit in a couple of suitcases. We sold everything else we could carry. And my parents and my two brothers and little sister went down to Port Authority on 42nd Street. And we bought six bus tickets. And we bought, we boarded a Trailways bus for Jacksonville, Florida. We were moving from Hell's Kitchen, New York City, to Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. I mean, goodbye to New York's cold, snowy winters. And hell, the Jacksonville's beautiful, cold, snowy beaches. That's the luckiest 14 year old in the history of the world. I mean, endless summers, bikini, suntan lotion. I thought I was the luckiest 14 year old in the history of the world. The Jackson Little Sun, it was hot. There were no beaches to be found. You see, I guess I got caught up in the excitement here and now we're moving to Jacksonville. I didn't realize that there's another Jacksonville instead of Jacksonville, Florida. There's another Jacksonville in Texas. I ended up moving from a city of 7 million people to a little East Texas town of about 7,000 people from about 111 miles southeast of Dallas, you know, right? Just 30 miles south of here. From the city of the Madison Square Garden to my new place over here, the Tomato Bowl. From a city that had thousands of cabs to one cab driver and a guy wasn't even busy. I can go on and on, but you get the idea. The city was so nice, they named it twice. The tomato capital of the world, the tomato capital of the world. So after two years in Texas, if you know anything about Texas, which we all know, football is king. And so I had a dream to go to the University of Texas. All my friends were going there, pretty girls, a good education. Then reality set in. At the age of 18, I had to make a choice. Either let my brother and little sister go to foster care or become their legal guardian at the age of 18. Then I thought about my parents, both deaf mutes. My father with a sixth grade education in Spanish. They had to overcome obstacles on a daily basis that we all take for granted. I mean, how do you get from point A to point B in a city like New York without being able to read, write, talk to you? How do you get a job if you can't even talk at an interview? And if you get the job, how do you keep the job if you can't even hear what your coworkers are telling you? And how do you find the one? So I realized that if my parents can overcome obstacles like that every day in their lives, to become a legal guardian to my little brother and sister would be snapped. And the next day, I got a, uh, after my graduation, I got a job working for a road construction company, flat four dollars an hour. And standing in the hot sun, all I could think about was saving enough money to buy some sort of transportation and start wondering about my future. And over the summer, I saved a thousand dollars, and I. I uh, Bought a 1967 Chevy Impala. You probably don't remember those cars, but it was one of those cars they liked at Goodfellas, you know, with a trunk so big, you give a couple of your dead friends a ride to the dump. Well, I left the road crew and I got a job working at Montgomery Ward, selling, selling uh, working 30 hours a week, selling appliances that I couldn't afford. So there I was, driving a $600 Chevy Impala, working. Uh, being a legal guardian of my little brother and sister, working 30 hours a week in Montgomery Wards, we're enrolled in school 18 hours at, at TJC, paid my way through college, lived in a small, painfully one bedroom apartment, interpreting for my parents, and for good measure, I decided to join a fraternity. Next thing I knew, what happened a couple of my fraternity brothers nominated me to be president of the local chapter. And my opponent was a guy named Troy Phillips out of Dallas. In a, Came from a wealthy neighborhood out of Highland Park. Had a four car garage, had a gardener, had Dotson beautiful 280ZX. You remember those Dotson 280ZX? The sports up cars of all sports cars. In town, he had a two bedroom apartment. Always had a lot of cash in his pocket. Didn't have to work, and his tuition was paid for in full. And when they announced the next president of Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity, it was Jose Feliciano. Everything went quiet. Inside, I was so happy. And at that moment, when I realized that that is what my father had been telling me all those years, stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. Just be. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. Just be. Just be Jose. Don't try to be someone else. Just be the best that you can be. And, and at that moment, when I realized the words of Mark Twain, I don't know if you've heard this word. He said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. You know, it turns out 
that the same parents that I was embarrassed about at the age of 12 because of the gym, because of the death, turns out to be the most powerful lessons that I learned in my life. I mean, I always had love, family, friendships. They taught me by example to be kind, caring, and considerate. They taught me to be a leader, but they taught me the most important lesson was to stop worrying about what everybody else thinks and just be. And, I'm, and I say that because so many of us spend so much time worrying about what other people think of them that it stops them from making, being the best that they can be, which, which can prevent us from making bold choices and taking risks. Because the thing I want to explain to you, and, and, and it really means more to an older uh, generation, that we only have 168 hours a week. You know, and 58 of those hours are spent sleeping. So that leaves us about 112 hours each week to play with every day. Now, we're all lucky enough to be living in a world where technology has made our lives a little easier. The rapid transportation hasn't created more time. It's just gave us back some of the time we used to spend getting that back. The internet hasn't created more time, but it has given us time to get have access to more uh, information. You know, uh, being able to communicate with our clients and friends and family instantly with the touch of a button. Yet with all these newfound efficiencies, we're all seeming to be busy with that. And our quality of life is in direct reflection of how we choose to engage our 168 hours. And even though over the last 500 years, even with all the technical and social advancements of the last 500 years, the one thing that hasn't changed is that we have to prioritize our time. We have to decide for ourselves how to use our time. Concentrate on the more important things versus the less important things in life. But no matter how carefully we try to prioritize our time, most of us will still look back at some of our choices. Or if I knew then what I know now, I would have chosen to spend my time in a different way. Y'all find yourself in that? You know? See, our quality of life is in direct reflection of how we choose that time. And there was a guy, I don't know if, if your classes are covering this, but this, there was a, a writer named uh, Stephen Covey. And he authored a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he had a quote in there that says, The enemy of the best is often the good. The enemy of the best is often the good. There's a lot of good things to do. But our quality of life is at its best when we choose to engage in the best things. And whenever possible, and you guys did, did delegate those things that are less important to the quality of life to someone else. Okay? Because take faith and faith and spirituality. Is it delegatable? No. How about your health? Well, just because you can pay a personal trainer $75 an hour, does it mean that you can delegate your health? $500 an hour still doesn't get the job done either. Now you would think that paying somebody a thousand dollars an hour uh, would make a difference, but we're the ones who have to sweat. We're the ones who have to exercise and keep a healthy diet. We have to take that responsibility. So we've got to decide ourselves how important our health is to us, and how many of our 168 hours a week are we willing to spend on that? What about family? Can you delegate that? Some people try, but you can't hire a nanny to raise your kids to love you. And even though we try to justify our choices, say, oh, well, that's okay. At least we're spending quality of time together. It's just really an excuse to make us feel better for ourselves. Because how many of us, of us would like to spend more time, many more hours per week than we currently do, being with our friends, family, the people we care about most? But we have to make the effort and the conscious time to organize our time and dedicate some of our 168 hours to those things. Now, how about Vacations. Can you delegate somebody on vacation? How many of you in this room is going to pay somebody else in this room to go, hey, here's $5,000. Why don't you go on vacation for me and send me a postcard and tell me how much money you have? If you know anybody like that, send them my way. Because I will take the $5,000. I will take the vacation. I promise I'll send a postcard. Matter of fact, I'll get my wife and my daughter send a postcard from Hawaii, too. They came over $15,000. What is my point? Point is, you can't delegate. So time is very important. And what you guys do with your time here is and prioritizing time, you can you can get it all in. Now I wanted I wanted to talk about the two hour house. Um, a buddy of mine named Brian Conaway, 
You ever heard of Conway Helms around here? Have you seen some of the signs? Um, ended up being the president of the local chapter for the Home Builders Association. And he was looking for a way to community, looking for a way to increase the membership for the association. And sometimes a simple idea has the ability to make a real difference. His idea to increase the membership ended up getting industry competitors to band together and volunteer to do something very special for the community. They ended up breaking a world's record and creating a remarkable showcase for his industry and changed the way everybody involved with their lives. He had seen a news story about a house being built in California, the, the 2,300 square foot house in three hours, 44 minutes and 59 seconds. And the more he looked at it, the more he said to himself, if I had the right volunteers, we could beat that record. And so with by identifying local tradesmen and supply, suppliers with motivation and by recruiting volunteers to be part of this near impossible project, that he figured that a whole lot of lives would change for the better. I mean, think about it. He wanted to complete a 2,300 square foot house uh, in a time it takes to watch a Monday night football game. So let's imagine this. Imagine all the building materials sitting on an empty lot, uh, building the house that you live in today. Every sheet of wall boards, drop of painting, every building material sitting on an empty lot, waiting on the construction crew to arrive. And then after playing 18 holes of golf, coming back to that place. And having a 2,300 square foot house complete the landscape. Okay? So, having a vision of what we want to accomplish in life is the easy part of the journey. And trying to use that project to increase the associate's membership for the benefit of charities was a great idea. But we all have great ideas, or at least ideas we think are great. But the real obstacle in pulling that off was realizing that he had to motivate even 600 tradesmen, suppliers, and volunteers to challenge themselves to liberate their entrapped mind from thinking that things can't be done to knowing that we're all destined for remarkable results, okay? Now, what was important to me to be successful in life was that I'm just not that handy around the house. And look forward to the day that there's no way, I mean, the fact that it would take me 20 minutes to figure out how to screw in the light bulb, the fact that these guys built a 2,300 square foot house at a time it would take me to screw in a night lamp bulb and blew my mind. And it wasn't easy convincing a group of skilled construction workers that it could be done anyway. Because even the most experienced worker will tell you it takes at least a day or two to, to set, set the form, dig the footings for the foundation before the concrete is poured and finished. Then it takes a day to pop the lines before framing the walls and another day to frame the walls. And then, uh, and of course, that's only the rough end. But think about the, the roof, the countertops, the kitchen cabinets, the interior doors and baseboards, uh, 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 the sheetrock, all of it, turnkey in less than 20. How do you get a group of 579 volunteers to work together to do an impossible project like that? Well, he realized, he realized What he did is that he relied on each individual's passions for what they did best. I read a Harvard Business School study probably about 15 years ago and how very, how do you affect, uh, I read a Harvard Business School study that, that uh, uh, how do you challenge people to their passions? And so I went to every employee at our company, and I went to everyone and I said, what are you going to do at work next? And after reviewing the results, we found that task that was one person's weakness, something they may be doing on a daily basis or weekly basis, is somebody else's strength and their passion. And so by rewriting a number of job descriptions and what they love to do, the result was almost the immediate. We had a 40% increase in productivity. And what we found is that most people in business or in our lives, we have a tendency to focus on the weaknesses instead of running with people's strengths. And what I learned from that experience by rewriting a number of those job descriptions, I was actually taking one employee's quote unquote work and making another employee's play. That's that. And when you have a culture of play in a workplace, it's truly amazing how productive 
people can be on their way to becoming the best version of themselves. I mean, how many times do we really focus on the weakness? And you kind of see that with your parents, and you kind of see that if you have kids, you, you, you got to watch yourself do the same thing. But in a perfect world, we all want our kids to succeed in life. And so we want, and some of us expect our kids to come home with straight A's. When every report card comes home with three A's and one B and a C, what actually happens? We focus on the C, right? Instead of running with the three A's and the B. And that C is a perfect example of the Harvard Business School study. Maybe they don't like the teacher. Maybe someone or something is disrupting their class. Or maybe they just, it's just, that's a weakness. And so I always like to make it a point when I see my daughter to every day to always, I ask her, tell me two things you're really proud of today. And what you'll find, most people will have to stop and really think about what they're proud of. Because everybody can tell you what went wrong during the day. But how I many, it's difficult to tell you what went right during the day. And it takes practice to focus on the positive. But I promise you, it'll change the way you look at yourself. It'll change how you look at your accomplishments. And it'll change the way you look at the future. And that's what I love about the two-hour house story. It changed the way every one of the 579 volunteers looked at themselves. And look at their accomplishments. And in a profound way, I believe it changed the way they look at the future. And it's one thing, if you can understand that, it's one thing that Brian understood. And, and the reason why I use the house analogy it relates to planning. But one thing he understood is that some people can do things better and faster than we can, which allows us to focus on things that are really important to us. And it should remind us that we can all turn our impossibles to what is possible with clarity, belief, and passion. So I want to show you what it looks like. And, I, and you're in class. How many of you taking an entrepreneurial class? What's, what's your name? Business management. Business management? Um, human, human resources. Mm-hmm. Mechanical engineering. Industrial technology. Industrial technology. Accounting. Nursing. Nursing. Mm-hmm. Free dance. Mm-hmm. Nursing. Mm-hmm. Nursing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nursing. nursing. That's easy. Okay, got it. So here's the deal. What I'm about to show you applies to everybody. When I show you this house being built for three minutes, I want to tell you, tell me what has to happen to pull that off. It was a year and a half of planning to make sure we fulfilled every code. If you look at the magic behind this, nobody got paid. Now, the, I'm, I'm just telling you, the human spirit is alive and well. Sometimes in life, we just don't make the game big enough. Okay? The Herman Report suggests that 80% of all Americans work at 40% of the capacity because they don't have a strong belief in their true potential. Which suggests to me that creating a challenging and stimulating work environment can make an immediate and extraordinary changes in human spirit. And that's what I love about the two hour house is that Brian had to first imagine the completed house and then back into the project. He detailed each element and gave the crew chiefs the maximum amount of time they would have to accomplish their goal. Now we all have our processes and our process is guaranteed the job gets done. But can the way we do our job be done better, faster, more efficient? Of course. But sometimes it takes an outsider, someone's not directly involved with our processes, to take us out of our comfort zone, to make us learn and grow. And Brian was actually the outsider. He, he didn't tell the crew chiefs what to do. He just gave them the amount of time that they would have to accomplish their goals. And then he challenged their fullest potential. And what he had to do is to build this house, he had to deconstruct the house and then challenge everybody to shift their paradigm on how it could be done. So that's that's how this happened, but it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And why do I use the house metaphor for me? I'm in a financial services business. But I think it's the way you look at life. What do you want your house to look like, which represents your life? What do you want your house to look like? You've got to buy a new house. What do you want your community to look like? When you have that vision, begin with the end in mind, and you work backwards. Then you look at where you're at today, and you know step by step what you have to do to get there. Because they always say that when your visions are clear, your decisions are easy. Does that make sense? And when it's crystal clear and you know where you want to be and you got your ideal sitting in front of you, it's amazing how you set the goals and you're motivated to get there because the crap that gets out of the way because you know where you're going. Does that make sense? So as I look back through college for me, the one thing that I never really counted on was the overwhelming thoughts of self-doubt. And, but I can always see my father always saying, stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. Just do it. Self-doubt will always, every time it creeped into a little head, I could always see my dad going. So I took everywhere I went throughout life's challenges. And just be involved in to be, do, have. 
be the person you want to be. Do the things you need to do. You'll have the things you want to have. But B was always on the top of my list to get my party straight and get me centered. Because you can't be with it. You can't, you can't even begin to undertake the journey. And with your objectives clear, you're not swayed by the detours or looks like hiccups along the process because you can stay the course because you know where you're going. And with the destination in mind, life becomes an adventure I mean, filled with lessons and family and children and gifts and challenges, which also turns out to be gifts anyway. But if you just had Jose Felicio, New York City, with deaf parents, a beat up Chevy and Paul, and looked out to the future, and looked on food stamps, and looked, and looked out to the future, and thought about success, I'd have told you, no way, Jose. But just be that evolved into be you have, a lot of people focus on the dream and leave those doubts behind, behind us. Because here's the lesson that I that really hit me is that I learned a while back, a long time ago, was doubt's the enemy, not fear. Doubt's the father of all negative emotions and the thief who steals our dreams and makes us all play it safe. And we think that if we know where we're going, our vision is different. People might find us top of yourself centered, but doubt just kills the magnificent. Doubt actually says it can't be done, it's impossible. And then recently I learned, learned how to uh, respect my ally, doubt. Because doubt, I began to understand it. He is, or she is, the, has this, the secret in his hands. Doubt has to be overcome. By overcoming doubt, pays new ways for new rules, new limits, new records. He's kind of like the wise guardian that challenges the very best. We'll to step forward for each one of us. If we're prepared to look him in the face and say, God, I respect you. I know you value, but I am looking past you. Then I learned how to take you on as an advisor because doubt will, will tell you where your potential pitfalls are and tell you who's on board with the vision, which in turn will give you a little bit more energy. We need, it'll tell you where you need to spend a little more energy and maybe have a little more clarity. And as a, as a legal guardian, my, little, my siblings at the age of 18, I had to learn how to get past doubt fast. And move beyond believing and knowing that we all succeed. If I'd even stopped being thought about the challenges, I'd have been overwhelmed. And as we built Feliciano Financial Group, Do came along to be beside me. We had to do our homework every day, work in and on our business, always beginning with the end of life. And if you think just be is easy, let me share this with you. You have to believe in yourself. And when you look at your true, true potential, and you look at what you're doing every day and actually fulfilling it, being takes on a whole new meaning. It's a lesson in humility or it's kicking the pants as far as being the best version of itself goes. And so I, I don't know if you ever heard of Napoleon Hill. He's got a book called Think and Grow Rich because it, everything's in your mind, it's your mindset. My dad has a simple, he said, he would only do it. And, and boy, I tell you what, this is the most powerful symbol for me. Take that negative crap, turn it, and reprogram yourself. Change your perspective. Change how you look at things. Change. Do you see what I mean? Matter of fact, if I said any word, it cheapens the symbol. So if you're driving down the road, just do this. If you're in a funk, just do this. If you're talking negative to somebody about somebody, do this. You know what I mean? Because you got issues too. We all got issues. Nobody's perfect. Just love everybody every day. And so I bring that all up. It's got a symbol for that. Another symbol my dad used to say is don't shoot straight. Don't, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Just no poker hands. Put it on the table. Just be honest with everybody that you deal with. And communication is the key. There's a great book called Crucial Conversations. If you want to download it to your phone, listen to it. You have some issues with either your mom and dad or your uncle, or there's issues with friends, or there'll be issues with your mates. It will be issues that every day in your life, communication is the key to everything. And if you'll download the book, Crucial Conversations, you'll pick out things that you can do to be a better communicator. Because all you nurses, you're going to have to deal with docs, you have to deal with each other, you have to deal with families, and all that. Engineers, you got to deal with the people that you work with and inspire people to think, you know, create a safe place. We can have a world of Everybody hoarding information. What you want is everybody engaged on what the ideas want. Because if we were engaged together, it's amazing what we can do together than we can as individual clients. But the system has everybody divided and come. You understand what I mean? And we, what we got to do is unite because everybody is called infinite intelligence. And what infinite intelligence tells me is that you got an idea. And then he goes, oh man, we, 
we, we can do that. We can do this. You go, oh, man, we can do that. We can do this. Oh, we can do that. We can do this. And next thing you know, we come out with something better together than we are as single. Because guess what? Each one of us in this room are exactly who we are based on teachers, pe preachers, parents, environment, and whatever we agree with the That's exactly what we are. Each one of us. And there's no wrong or right. So everybody has a different paradigm from where they're from. If we all hear each other, well, we can really grow. And so I like to use a quarter sometimes. If I hold a quarter, I say, what are you seeing? Go ahead. So I'm going, oh, here it is. I see tails. Here, we can argue. We can go to war. We can go. We can go. But you know what? We're both right from our perspective. And, and I think that you can learn from each other when you all engage and create that safe environment. Does that make sense? Does that help? Okay. So Napoleon Hill wrote a book, Take and Grow Rich. And uh, there's some quotes in there that had a huge impact on my life. And what he said was, the most powerful instrument that you have in your hands is the power of your mind. And it's those words as much as any that have a huge impact in my life, which is why I'm here to share this with y'all. But it's the same great life lessons that I wrote about in Passion for Possibilities and learned by watching my parents overcome their obstacles has convinced me that success is as simple as turning the obstacles into opportunities. And uh, so I want to preach, I appreciate you guys coming today. And I hope I got another group that's going to, I'm going to be talking to at 115. But I want to know what you guys take away because I could talk all day long, but it doesn't matter what you take away from that. So I'm going to, we're going to go around the horn in just a minute. But uh, we encourage others to come in because I think it's a strong message, but I'll find out if it's a strong message based on what you say. Because what I say doesn't matter. What I did learn as professionals is two things I learned. What I learned is what we say isn't always heard and understood the way it was intended. And more importantly, what we hear isn't what's being said. Does that make sense, what he just said? You got that? Because you ever had that way? Someone said something, you thought something, but it wasn't what they meant. Okay? Same thing, vice versa. In order to enhance your communication skills there is when you say something, ask, do you mind feeding back to me what you heard? Now you're going to have a better communication instead of an assumption. I mean, sometimes they can be thinking about using the bathroom and they need to hear the word you said. You understand what I mean? You know, we all, you know what I'm talking about. That's very uh, important. And then um, I lost. Uh, oh, another thing too is uh, have, have, like right now you probably in your mind I want you to uh, two two quick lessons. One is uh, the parking lot that's out there. Can y'all imagine how many cars are out there? Can you see it in your mind? How many cars are out there? Now if I was sit there and I mentioned the color red. You can kind of how you, you see how you honed in on the colors and you look for the red, right? Uh, the lesson that I always like to say to groups is that, well, let's take this room for example. Um, Y'all look around the room. And uh, this time, when you look around the room, I want you to just focus on the color orange. Okay? All right, so the room hasn't changed, right? But our focus on those colors did. Which makes me wonder how many opportunities are staring us in the face every day that we just don't see. And follow one, get it? And as professionals, we need to be able to sit back, take in the world around us, be open to new ideas, open to the opportunities right in front of us by changing our focus. With me there? It's the difference of what should be and what could be. When you say something should be something, it's narrow thinking. When you say something could be, you're open to the possibilities. Have you seen it? Should, could. You follow me? So think if you can just shift that mindset to be open to the possibilities, you'll start to see all the opportunities around us. And empathy is very important. Empathy is basically the ability to share the feelings that are being experienced by others. It's conscious. It's actually the cornerstone of genuine human relationships. Empathy. Not only makes us better people, but it's the key to being better at what we do for a living by allowing us to always continue to switch our focus and see all the opportunities around us. That help? Okay. So, uh, and I want to thank you guys for allowing me to be here today. And uh, uh, so let's go around the horn and tell me what you take away. What's your take away? Put another spot on you. Yeah. Now, say again. Doubt is more powerful than fear. Would you tell me? 
Just try to tell yourself and you want to get open mind for this. Open mind and uh, don't let doubt block you. I'll come back to you. Okay, go ahead. Call it the same doubt. Doubt's big? Yeah, I have to do it. Okay. First of all, I was going to say something. So now, after doing what you mentioned about shooting, because I, I was um, like holding my seat back, it felt like it was for like something to me that was shooting good. Thank you. That's a big deal because once you do, you start to see things. It's right there, man. It's amazing when you want to see it. I'll give you an example, real quick. Thanks for sharing that. Can y'all picture a donut, a glazed donut sitting right on the front of you? Can you see the hole? Can you see the donut? Can you see the hole? When you look at things, you're right either way. It's what you choose to see. Got it? You can argue all you want, but you're right. No matter what argue you make, do you want to see the donut or the hole? That's your choice. It's a choice. Thanks for letting me allow you to add that on to that. It's a big deal. Go ahead. Let me see. You can probably add the path to whatever the future is because it might not be what you think the question will be. And this is a kind of step at a time, you don't know where you end up, so I'm not going to put too much of that down at the end. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to add a story that I link on. You ever heard of the guy who was in the middle of a lake and he's drowning, and a boat came up to him and said, Can I help you? He said, No, God will save me, God will save me. And he's drowning, and another boat comes up and says, Can I help you? No, God will save me. He dies and goes to heaven. God, why didn't you save me? Because I sent you two boats. So when I my my antennas are up, and when I see opportunity to come up, is that my boat? And if your awareness is like that, you'll be surprised at how many opportunities come to you every day that you just don't see. It's a weird deal, man, but it's a full of life. That's the way I look at it. Go ahead. Possibilities. Possibilities. There's so many possibilities. Once you want to doubt yourself, you have that clear vision of where you want to go. There's and that's endless possibilities. And think about what we're fed. We're all domesticated. We're all fed in our minds what other people's experiences have been. A lot of it we need to learn. Because so I can hug somebody today that told me when I was 19. He said, a person can learn by their mistakes. But a smart person learns by other people's mistakes. Isn't that right? So I've always had mentors. Even today, I've always had mentors. I know people who've been there. Why the hell did I figure it out myself? But if I do have an idea... I want to bounce it with people's experience, so make sure that am I missing something? So it makes me feel safe when I make a move. Does that make sense? What about you? Um, perspective is really important. So, like, seeing things from somebody else's angle is going to help you out a lot more. Like, somebody else sees something as like a problem, you can see it as like a hardship that can give you like a scale for an opportunity. That's beautiful. And another thing, too, is that Stephen Covey, one of the seven habits that I like to people, is to be understood, you must always seek to understand others. So in order to do that, I add to it, is when you do hear something, say that I heard you say this, is that right? They feel completely understood. That's going to enhance your relationship. And because you took the time to hear them completely, they're now going to hear your ideas too. And all you care about is the end result. You know, we get in the bicker of how we get there. But if we're hearing each other out, we want the same goal. You know what I mean? But it takes more of us because we need each other's experiences and eyes. see a goal we go after it that's healthy you know what i mean it's it's and it's good to, but at the same time as you go on that course there are things that you only go on based on your own mindset so if you allow other mindsets you can change the course as you go so i'm just i'm just adding to it that's beautiful what else what do you got um overcoming self-doubt and then realizing that you can focus on certain justifications yeah that's it now i'm going to add something thank you for bringing that up you ever heard that old saying love is blind now, let me tell you, it didn't hit me until like seven years ago what that really means to me. Now, so when you're in love, 
All you see is the strengths. You don't even think about the weaknesses. All your friends can tell you what the weaknesses are, right? But you're in love and you see the strengths. And I really believe, this is my opinion, I never did a study, but I believe what happens in relationships with breakup is because you take the weaknesses and then try to work on somebody's weaknesses and make them a strength. That's not who they are. You fell in love with the strength to stay with the strength. And if they love you, stay with your strength, you're going to have a harmony relationship. But we get in and we get married, now we want somebody to change. It ain't going to work. Do you know what I mean? Because we're all free. Does that make sense? I'm making, I'm making it extreme, but that, it makes sense to me. So if you actually fall in love, those are the strengths. Here are the weaknesses. They were already there. Quit focusing on them. That's the way I look at my experience. Go ahead, please. Um, one thing you said was our quality of life is when we choose the best thing. And I completely agree, and I think that I always kind of use a speech for no matter. But life doesn't stop to bring us the stressors and to put things on us. So if we choose the best thing, that's what we would give them. I think that our quality of life is the best thing. Yeah, and I'm going to add at the finish of the deal, like I began, was the place of my biggest challenge is always the source of my greatest strength and you just don't know it yet. You know what I mean? Until you back in the corner, man, your best version of yourself will come out swinging. If you've got abilities and just everybody plays it on the safe side. If you've got a lot more abilities than you think you have and you got to go out there and make it happen. Would you mind if I just tell I, 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 that's a big trait. And being in the moment's a big trait. Not how you doing when you pass by, you don't care how someone's doing. How you doing, talk to them. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's funny, my wife and I had a, a discussion this about a month ago. Why do you want me to look at you every time you look? It dawned on me. That's the way I communicate. My parents, I got to look at you to talk to you. <laughs> my kids sit there and talk to you. They're now. So I never really, you, you see how things come? So be there, you know? Don't be. Don't ever shake somebody's hand and head turn. That's the most nice thing in the world. That means you're not there with them. I, I take it as this. When someone does that, I go, oh, that's be there and love people every day for exactly who they are. We're all domesticated. You know? And we all know what we know based on what we know. And what we've been, we don't know if that's true. Just be open. Does that make sense? And I think it's going to, if you love everybody every day, life becomes pretty darn simple. And everybody is different. And just respect that. I think I think someone I read something when I was on school board in the nineties. Uh, someone said the three things that make America great: the right to disagree. We have to respect our rights to disagree. And we have to protect our rights to disagree. I thought that was pretty powerful. You know what I mean? Because everybody wants to be heard. I thought that was pretty cool. When you see when you see an obstacle that comes up, and you go, okay. How can I equip this to make this a win situation somehow? And then practice your communication skills and get other people involved. It's amazing you can overcome. I think you can overcome anything. I just don't, I just don't see how you can. So, um, what time is it? Uh, it's 11 11. 11 11. So, what's my time up to? Uh, we need to get out of here at 11 2. Okay, good. So, let's talk about, let's talk about the planning process. Yeah, and, and why? Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Go ahead. Um, usually our house is very limited, but I feel like Brian finally did it from a couple of perspectives. He didn't know. He, they didn't know him. And I want to know like, how we go to the level to be loved to be famous. I mean, not really. Well, well uh, here's the thing is that I think that if, if you went around the room, let me back it up another one. Well, you, well, I'll talk about my industry, for example. When well, people discuss insurance, boring. People start to discuss investments, boring. When well, they discuss estate planning, boring. Uh, tax planning, boring. Uh, financial planning, boring. Uh, so all those parts. But through our process, what we do is, what's important about money to you? And what comes out of it is security, freedom, independence, whatever your paradigm is. And what I learned about words, words are symbols, and it means different things to different people. And so if you were to, if I would ask each one of you in this room the word security, I would get a different answer all the time. If I asked you a word freedom, different, does that make sense? Motivation, 
different answers. So a word, always remember, is a symbol. I know what it means to me. I don't know what it means to you. What do you, what do you, do you follow me? So you have to peel the onion back. So when you say, I want to be independent, what's important about independence to you? While I watch my mom and dad struggle and I have to go to Rome, I just don't want to be a burden on my kids. Do you understand what I mean? What's important, what, what's important about that to you? Well, I, if I knew I was independent, then it allows me to be able to go do the things that I want to do. What's it, what does do what you want to do to you? Well, I want to be able to paint. I want to be able to be in the arts. I want to be able to do this. They start to really open up what they really want. And uh, as you do that, and, and if you look at the hierarchy of life, the bottom part is stuff and things. Independence, security, uh, freedom, buying a new house, car, whatever. But if you had all that, what, what's important about knowing you're at that place? Well, man, if I was at that place, I really want to help others. I want to, like I'm here, I love doing what I'm doing, sharing with you right now. It's because I feel like you want to impact others. And if people are different men. I want people to impact others because somebody helped me in college. Somebody helped me, my, my family. I want to be able to have an impact on the admissions trips. I want to be able to help my family. I want to help my, whatever it is, it's about others. Then the next question is, what if you, what's important about helping others to you personally? Then it's Nevada, my life on purpose. That's what I'm here this earth to do and so forth. You follow me? So what I try to get people to understand is that you can just get accumulate your stuff and things, but you can be helping people along the journey to live life on purpose. You don't have to wait on stuff and things to live your life on purpose, to have your purpose in life. Are you with me? So it doesn't really take money to do it. It's a way of being to be rich. Does that, does that make sense? What I'm saying? So to add, is you peel the onion back, and when your when your boyfriend, whoever you describe it, your husband, or mom, or dad, or if you ask them what's important to them and hear them out, and they find their their why, then they will take action to do what needs to be done to make it happen. That's an inspiring process to me. Everything else is about stuff and things. Did that help? Okay, so finding out what's important to them. What do they mean by it? Do not assume what you heard is what you mean because that's your life. It's not theirs. And I do that with every employee in our, our office. Every person that I deal with, I want to find out what's important to others because if I help everybody get what they want, I'm going to naturally get what I want. Right? You just help everybody grow, you're naturally going to grow. I mean, that's just to figure out how to figure that out. So then the estate plan, they see why it's important because it matches what they're trying to accomplish. They're tax planning what they're trying to accomplish. We're saving money for education or whatever, whatever, they're, whatever they're, what's important. We play a facilitator's role to bridge the gap from where they are to where they want to be for the reasons that are important to them, not us. Does that make sense? So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, anything else? Any other questions for us? Okay. What would you say is Uh, my parents, what I learned is that in society, I think everybody wants to help. And I think we have a tendency to somehow be conditioned you should, don't ask a dumb question, which limits you. Um, you should know everything, which you never will. <laughs> and uh, but watching my parents, um, we would drive down the road, I was 13 or 11, and let's say we had to go to 16, 16 Sycamore Street. There's a house in Sycamore. We pull in the gas station, I'm always, hey, do you know what 16, 16 Sycamore? Yeah, I think Sycamore is over there. I go over the towards there, and I get somebody, where's 16 Sycamore? And it always took us to my, up to the house before. But along the journey, people are there to help you. Get to where you want to be, if you ask. And most of us don't ask for help. And if you'll find yourself asking for help, you'll find how genuine people are and they want to help. They really, really get the help. And it's professors staying afterwards. Uh, you got all the resources here. Let me tell you, the guys that I'm just going to say this. But when I was a senior, I took college bound English. English was, I just made the D's all my life English. But I went because all the pretty girls were in there. That's just bottom line. But when I went in there, though, I asked for help. And they all helped me get through what I didn't do. But I learned that people will help you. And you leverage on their strength. And they start to leverage on your strength. And one and one is not two. One and one is 11. It's the way I look at it. And it's quantum leaps. If you get that. 
And if you say, man, let's do this together, it's all more fun. I'm a collaborative kind of guy. I like to do things together with people and everything. So that's just my nature. But I've never been afraid to ask for help because in my parents, I've always had to ask for help. Is it, did that help? Okay. And then I think the motivation for me, you know, we were in a $50 a month house in Jacksonville, Texas, right across from this native home. I had to walk two hours to school, do two day football practice. I developed friendships, and I just was always uh, respectful of others. You know, don't judge them. But I think I was like, a, I like people to come together. So I do 20 years of grizzly parties in town, in town. And then um, now I'm the chairman of the heart, heart ball, which is, you know, it's kind of the dying <laughs> thing. I can go in there and get my friends and let's create a memory. I always tell, I tell them all, I just play in the sandbox and let's create a memory. It's a foam moment. Fear of missing out. You know what I mean? Because if you do that, people want to come back all the time. But you got to make it fun for everybody. So thanks for doing that. Any, any other questions? The, the questions spur these different things. That's why the dynamics, are, it's hard for me to cover all these things, but I can relate it to your situation. Um, fear and doubt is very important. Communication, cover that. You saw what happened here. It's efficiency, organization, time management, leadership, motivation. There's actually 76 principles that I wrote down from the story. If you've asked me what I would love to do if I had the time, I'd like to write 76 books on each principle and say, you know, freedom from the ground up, inspiration from the ground up. You know what I mean? Like, like so, so the dummies. <laughs> you know that technology for dummies and that book, what the book? You know what I'm talking about. You know, I thought that was a pretty cool book. So I think I'm, I'm good on time. I think we're down to about 10, 10 minutes. Any other questions? Because we're here to share together. What did you, so you took away a lot today. Was it beneficial for you to be here? Got it? I want you to share with others. I want to have two times the room because I want to affect more people. And I'm asking for your help. Share with others. Tell them to get their rear ends in here. And we'll get them to look at life a different way. And if I could do that, we all could do that, then we, we just all make benefit from it. One last thing is, I have a, there's a young professional group here in town. It's a great group. If you just look it up, Tyler Young Professionals. And it's a great group to get involved in. And I sponsor that group. There's four of us, uh, Harvey Sharp, Tom Miller, myself, and Pam Walters. And I had about 60 of those young professionals at my house. And I said, I bet you're wondering why a guy like me would sponsor the young I said, listen, there's three reasons they're all self serving. I said, number one, I can't get my 55 year old friends to get out anymore, so I got to find some new blood. <laughs> I said, number two, it's important to us, we all need each other in society. And if the more you know, the more everybody networks, everybody becomes successful, especially if you're looking for each other's unique abilities. And then number three, it's important to me for everybody to be successful. Because I just want to make sure my social security check comes in when I'm 65 years old. <laughs> anyway, so it's a shit that way. I think that's pretty cool. But we all want to help each other grow, and it's amazing how fast you can grow if you lean on each other. And we all have different unique abilities. I've got two brothers and a sister. We all work together. Everybody's different, but we have job description that they want to do. And that's why we get along. Instead of everybody trying to be what's the name of the group? Huh? Language group? Uh, the Tyler Young Professional, the TYPN. Just look it up on Google and all those things, but those are your opportunities. And the more people you meet, the more opportunities. And it's very important that the more you meet strangers, the more it will open your world because you'll start to see things they see that you never was aware of, if you're listening, if you're intended to. So the more you meet strangers, the more you get into other people's world, the more you're going to grow your world. Does that sound cool? All right, so the place of my biggest challenge is always the source of my greatest strength. Thank you.